Hey guys and welcome back to another episode of Game Hammer. It's a horrible weather outside, I'm a bit under the weather and as a result I'm feeling pretty nostalgic. So today we're going to have a look at a bundle of uh, programs that I think anyone who had an Amstrad CPC from the mid 80s onward is probably quite familiar with. Let's have a look at the Amsoft 12 pack. <laughs> If you bought an Amstrad CPC after 1986, there's a very good chance that it came bundled with the Amsoft 12 pack. This set of launch titles for the system demonstrates the range of uses the CPC could be put to and served as an excellent introduction to Amstrad computing. The pack contained a word processor, a couple of educational titles, and a few early games that were not only colourful, but also an excellent demonstration of the kind of games the CPC was really good at working with. Amstrad boasted that this pack represented over £100 of value. Did it really? I'll let you decide on that one. For my part, I never had the 12 pack. My first CPC was released too early to have been bundled with it, and so was its replacement. Even the modded 464-6128 hybrid that I still have now was an old-style high-key CPC, so when I bought it as a bundle in 1990, even it didn't come with the 12 pack. I had to rely on borrowing tapes from friends to see these games in action back in the day. So this week on Gamehammer, we're going to take a look at all 12 of these classic titles. Do they stand up to the test of time, or are they just a bunch of crap that Amstoff couldn't sell without giving them away for free with the computer? Let's take each one in turn and find out. We'll start with Xanagrams, the crossword game. This piece of early educational software was made by Dean Software, whom I wouldn't be surprised to find you've never heard of outside of this program. After Xanagrams, they made very few programs for the CPC, mostly music software and bookkeeping utilities, so this is quite an outlier. Xanagrams was supposedly simple enough for a young child to get into, but also challenging enough to give adults a run for their money. Let's see if it's actually true. It's a simple game at heart. You can choose from three levels of difficulty, with one being the easiest and three being the hardest. But to be absolutely honest, it doesn't really change the game itself. The difficulty level instead selects from one of three word lists that the game can choose its words from. After that, you pick how many words you want to try to work out, from one word up to five. The words link together like a crossword, but there the similarity ends. You get a list of possible letters down the right hand side of the screen and these determine what you can choose from for each position in the game. The fewer letters you get wrong when choosing, the higher your score at the end of the game. But if you're stuck, you can just go through each letter in sequence until you find the letter that the computer wants. There are no crossword clues, it's all just trying to find the right letter. And when you get the letter right, the game doesn't move the cursor either, you have to do that yourself. As a result, it gets tedious quickly, even when you know what word the game is wanting you to spell out, because you have to move the cursor in between each letter choice. All in all, it's a reasonable demonstration of the CPC's ability to handle a large number of possible words. The game boasts 4,000 that it can choose from, but aside from a sheer memory demonstration, there's very little here. Basic type-in games have more staying power than this, which is a shame. Let's move on. There are few things more sad than playing a virtual fruit machine. The only thing sadder that I can think of is actually paying money for a virtual fruit machine, because that way you're out of cash with no actual way to win it back. As games go, Fruit Machine demonstrates the CPC's ability to handle bold, colourful graphics and… well, that's about it. This is definitely the worst program in this pack, and when we see some of the stuff that's still to come, I think you'll understand that that's a very low bar indeed. There is literally nothing good that I can say about this game. The sound is next to non-existent, there's no gameplay, and without the possibility of actually winning money, there is literally no point to playing this game. If I had to squeeze something positive out of this, um, well, I suppose we can technically call it a game, then it would be that there's a counter of how much virtual money you've put into the machine compared to how much virtual money that you've supposedly got out of it. The in tally will vastly exceed the out tally, thus demonstrating how much of a money sink fruit machines really are. So there you go, it's a valuable life lesson. Let's move on. Oh good grief, it's Bridget. This is one of those three games by Epic Soft Egypt, a company that seems to have been formed simply to make a handful of launch titles for the Amstrad CPC. The other games they made include the infamous Roland on the Run, which we covered in our episode on the Roland games earlier this year, link in the description. Some people love this game, others hate it. I'm in the camp 
where I can play it for a while and kind of enjoy it. It's a simple premise, you have to lower bridges at the right time in order to let a bunch of men go from their house to their workplace. It's simple to get the hang of, but rather difficult to master. Graphically, it's very impressive. The bold colours and chunky sprites were very definitely a visual delight back at the start of the CPC's life. The music isn't great, it's a fugue of a football tune and a Christmas tune, which is very strange for a game that launched in the middle of the year alongside the CPC 464, but it's not too bad and you can always turn the music off with a press of a key if you absolutely detest it. Bridget is a decent little game that won't keep you hooked for hours, but it only takes a couple of minutes to load and it's fun for 5 or 10 minutes of pop, so I'm going to put this one in the plus column. What home computer is complete without a word processor? None, that's what. For early adopters of the Amstrad CPC, the go-to program for writing letters, and I seriously doubt anyone was using it for more than that, just because it sucks when there's a lot of text in the memory, was Easy Am's Word. Programmed by Juniper Computing, who produced a small batch of early home office utilities for the CPC range, it was a basic introductory word processor, so let's see how it fares. On the whole, it is pretty basic. You get to choose between mode 1, 40 columns, or mode 2, 80 columns for the display, which is nice. Personally, I would only go for mode 2 when writing in this, because the space on the screen in 40 column mode, as you're seeing here, is negligible which means that you'll quickly end up having to scroll when typing in order to see what you've already written. The scrolling is slow, going back up the screen is tedious, and so is deleting text. This is pretty basic stuff, but given that it's a launch title, that's to be expected. As with all launch software for the CPC, the people coding it had around two weeks with a demonstration machine in order to get the software together. At the end of that two week period, an Amstrad rep would arrive to collect the machine, and that was that. The point, from Amstrad's perspective, was to get as much software written as quickly as possible, because computers at that time lived and died on how much software was available for them. Amstrad didn't want the CPC to go the way of so many others, so they made sure that there was a large amount of software around, even if their means of doing so would reduce the quality of that initial lineup. Easy Amps Word isn't exactly up to Tassword standards, but given the circumstances of its production, it's pretty effective. And nevertheless, it's an effective little program that doesn't take too much time to load and gives a reasonable output for what it is. Type-ins and many magazines will quickly outshine it, but as launch titles go, and especially as something that was bundled with so many CPCs, it's not all that bad. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, I already covered the Roland games in their own video, so I'm not planning to spend an awful lot of time on Roland on the Ropes. Suffice to say, this is one of the two games that Indescomp created in order to win the contract to distribute the CPC in Spain. It's a very nice port of their classic ZX Spectrum game, Fred, and it's a lot of fun to play. Personally, I prefer some of the later Roland games, but I can't fault this one in terms of gameplay. Well, I can. The screen flicker is annoying. Aside from that, however, it's a lot of fun, and you can still get a lot of enjoyment out of it, even today. Next up, we have a game that needs very little introduction. If you've ever played a futile waste of time that we call 20 Questions, then you've played Animal Vegetable Mineral. It's one of the educational titles in the 12-pack, and it's basically here so that parents can be reassured that the computer that they just bought their little kids isn't simply there to rot their brains. Created by Bourne Educational Software, which is sadly no relation to the much more interesting Jason Bourne of the book and film series, AVM, as the game identifies itself when loading in, was one of several educational titles they produced for the Amstrad. They produced everything from word and number games through to physics revision and map reading. Perhaps they'll be worth revisiting one week for a special on their stuff? We'll see. For the moment, let's take a look at Animal Vegetable Mineral. As I said before, it's a game of 20 questions. I'm going to think of a mineral here, bauxite, and we'll see how long it takes the computer to guess it. Oh, it can't guess it. It gives up very quickly. Why is that? It's because we haven't loaded in a word list, I suppose. Oh well. The game learns quickly, however, and now it knows seven words. My goodness. Do we want to play again? No, not really. Let's move on. Created by stalwart coders of fantastic games for the early CPC era, Gem Software, Oh Mummy is one of the standout titles in the 12 pack. There are few people from the CPC scene and beyond, as this title came out on several systems, who would have had a bad word to say about this classic game. The 
premise of the game is simple. Navigate the rudimentary maze, outlining each of the blocks with your footprints so it will either turn into a different colour or open up to reveal a prize, or a mummy. When you've outlined every box, head to the exit to proceed to the next level. The only thing standing in your way is a horde of mummies who don't want you there. The number of mummies will increase with each level, and if you open the wrong area up on the map, another mummy will climb out to join them. Touch a mummy even for a fraction of a second, and you lose a life. Lose all your lives, and it's game over. Sound simple? Well, for the most part, it is. And if you manage to get through all five levels, the game hands you an extra life, and you go back to level one to keep on playing. Theoretically, it could run forever, if you were so inclined. I doubt you'll manage to keep going with that music playing on a loop, however, it's not the best rendition of that famous tune that I've ever heard, but my goodness, it will stick in your head for a lot longer than you'll be playing this game. I love this game. It's a classic. If it had been released in arcades at the start of the 80s, it would very likely have been a big hit. As it stands, its legacy is being one of those games that most people my age will look at and say, Oh yeah, I remember that game. I loved it. What was it called again? Incidentally, if you're interested in seeing all the other versions of Oh Mummy for various old computers, Chinny Vision has put together a fantastic video comparing them all. There's a link to his video in the description. If you weren't a fan of Oh Mummy, you were probably a fan of Harrier Attack, written by Jurel Software, who now make bespoke financial applications and are apparently doing quite well out of it. The game was a scramble-like military action game set in the Falklands War. The game is around 9k in size and loads in under 3 minutes from tape which is amazing. It looks like a Spectrum clone, which is an early sign of things to come for the CPC, but it plays exceptionally well for such an early game. One quirk of the game is the need to press the space bar to bomb things. Presumably this is a way of protecting against anyone using a one-button joystick or an Atari controller, since they were compatible with the CPC. As a result, you need to keep one hand on the keyboard to be able to bomb the enemies, even when you're using a joystick. It's an odd setup, but it's not the only game that did this, so CPC users had to get used to it. Despite this quirk, Harrier Attack is one of the best early CPC games, and it's still a lot of fun to play even now. Whether you've got 5 minutes to spare for a quick blast, or you fancy settling in for an hour, I think you'll find Harrier Attack can keep you occupied. You have a limited number of rockets to fire, and a limited number of bombs to drop, as well as limited fuel. These all get replenished when you get to the end of the level and land back on your ship, providing you can make it that far. Ships will fire missiles at you, other aircraft will fire rockets at you, there's flak in the sky everywhere, but thankfully that won't kill you if you hit it. Don't get too comfortable though, because pretty much everything else in this game will definitely kill you if you hit it. You've got to keep your wits about you in this game. Oh, and don't bomb your ship when you take off. You'll want to, because everyone does it at least once, but it doesn't end well for you if you do. Here's another title by Indescomp. This time, it's a space shoot 'em up in the arcade style. It's also very much maligned, although I can't for the life of me think why. Okay, sure, it's hard as nails, but the sound is good, the graphics are nice and bold, and there's even a custom font, which the majority of software that launched the CPC never bothered with. There's really a lot to like about this game. It loads in just under three and a half minutes, so it's good for a quick blast of fun before your homework, and that's really all it was designed for. I like it. It's simple arcade action, and if you're willing to give it a chance, it really does grow on you. Speaking of the ridiculously hard games that grow on you, here's Roland in the Caves. The other Roland game written by Indescomp in order to win the Amstrad distribution contract for Spain. This one is a direct clone of their much-loved Spectrum title, Bugaboo the Flea. Apparently, according to internet rumours anyway, the reason for the name change was a joke by Lord Sugar. When shown the game as a demonstration, he quipped that the character should be named after the CPC's lead designer, Roland Perry. Indescomp didn't get the joke, and actually changed the name of the character, both in this game and in Roland on the Ropes, thus Amstrad's mascot character was born. Is that a true story? I don't know. It's funny though. I've covered this one in my Roland series video as well, so I won't linger on it here. Suffice to say, it's incredibly hard, but it's a lot of fun, and there's a good reason why so many people consider both this and the Spectrum original to be absolute classics of early gaming. It's keyboard only, but when you see how sensitive it is on the controls, you'll understand why using a joystick with it would have been next to impossible. Give this one a try, it's a classic. The title screen music's cool too. Okay, 
Put your hand up if you could write a pseudo 3D game in under a fortnight. Keep your hand up if you could do it on a computer you've only just got your first real look at. Now, keep your hand up if you could do it in under 650 lines of BASIC. If you still got your hand up, you must have worked for Gem Software back in the early 80s and you probably coded Sultan's Maze. This is the second game from Gem Software in this bundle, the other being Oh Mommy. Gem were a company that got their start in 1981 coding for the ZX Spectrum, so they knew the Z80 CPU that also powered the CPC quite well, and it shows in the quality of the games that they were able to put out for this machine. Oh Mummy, Sultan's Maze, Roland in Time, Roland in Space, Doors of Doom and Kabbalah are all highly impressive entries for the early CPC. Gem certainly knew how to code something that would make people sit up and take notice, although I'll freely admit the games won't always hold your attention past the initial wow factor. This game is sometimes disregarded because it's rather slow to draw the screen, but given the circumstances, are you surprised? This thing is generating a 3D maze on an 8-bit computer on the fly and it's doing it while compiling each line of basic code as it goes. Quite frankly, I'm more than impressed by what this thing is managing to pull off here, especially given that this is a launch title. Clearly Amstrad were impressed as well, since a few screens from Sultan's Maze are included in the CPC's welcome tape, the first thing that most new purchasers of the computer would have loaded up. Gameplay wise, it's not a lot to write home about. This is a basic maze game, no pun intended, where you'll do well to manage to get out alive, let alone collect some gems for your trouble. There's a ghost wandering around to fight you, but it doesn't seem to move in any set pattern, and you can go an entire game without seeing it. As impressive a programming feat as this game is, Sultan's Maze isn't one that you're going to come back to very often, it's fun for a while, but you'll quickly tire of it and move on to something else. Ok, here we are at the last of this mixed bag of tricks. It's Time Man 1, and it's another educational program from Born Educational Software. This time, it's about telling the time, so it's very different to the last program. I have to admit that this is the first time I've ever taken a look at Time Man 1. A couple of my friends had the Amsoft 12 pack when we were kids, and we played the games from it, but we never, and I do mean literally never here, loaded this program up. So even though I had access to it back in the CPC's heyday, I never felt compelled to give it a try. Trying it now doesn't make me feel like I was missing out. This is basic stuff, basic educational stuff that would have been right at home on the BBC Micro in a school classroom. It works, and I can't help but feel it was designed especially to be simple and easy enough for a very young child to understand, but there's nothing here for anyone who is old enough to load up this YouTube video on their own. The limited animation there is here is decent, although I have to question the length of the arms on the stick figure. Who is this guy, Slenderman? Also, the music is obnoxious, but that may just be because I didn't turn the sound down on CPC. Actually, no, it is just obnoxious music. Oh well, at least it gives children a horrible shock when they get their mutant stick figure to finally finish climbing that ladder to nowhere, and if that's not a metaphor for adult life, I don't know what is. So anyway. Let's leave this alone and take a look at the Amsoft 12 pack as a whole. It's been a bit of a mixed bag really, but I think that was very much what Amsoft were going for. Alan Sugar wanted the CPC to be able to compete on every level, be it in schools, in offices or in the home. He wanted a computer that could do everything, and which could be seen to do everything. Under those circumstances, the Amsoft 12 pack definitely hits the mark. And now, ok, the word processor is slow and could definitely be improved upon, but as a demonstration of what the CPC could handle, it works. Amsoft sold better word processors, as well as a variety of other office tools such as spreadsheets, and there would be far superior entrants into all these fields very quickly after the CPC's launch. But you can't say Amstrad didn't launch their new all-in-one computer without having an office package right there from day one. And when the 12 pack started being bundled with the computer, Easy Am's word was right there from the moment that you opened the box. In that respect, it works to have this program in the pack in, even though everyone knew that anyone who actually wanted to use their CPC as a word processor would be upgrading from this package pretty sharpish. Similarly, the educational packages serve a very clear purpose too. Amstrad 
wanted to get a bite at the educational market and break into a few schools and place the BBC Micro. It succeeded, and the educational software available was pretty decent for the time. It's not going to win any awards now, and quite frankly some of this stuff is pretty limited, but it did what it was supposed to do, and schools, parents and so forth could buy better software if they wanted it. So I can't fault their aim with any of these selections. They showed the CPC could handle itself in education, and that was clearly the aim. As for the games, you've got some absolute classics in here, with a few crap ones to pad the box out. While people can take Bridget or leave it, the two Roland games plus Harry Attack and Oh Mummy make this selection a big hit in my view. I've bought commercially released compilations for less of a percentage of top titles than I found in this bundle. So on a gaming standpoint, I'm actually very impressed. There's a lot to like here. So all in all, the Amsoft 12 pack actually stands up rather well even under modern scrutiny. The purpose of the bundle was clear, showcase what Amstrad's new computer could do in each of the three key areas, business, home and education. And in that respect, I'd say it passes with flying colours. Well there you are, it's one of those things where if you know what they were aiming for, it actually succeeds quite well at those aims. In terms of the average person wanting to play a game on their new computer, actually you do quite well too because it had some good games. I mean, okay, there are a couple in there that a lot of people won't like, but that's how compilations are. So I think, actually, on the whole, Amsoft did quite well with this pack, and I'm actually very impressed. A lot of these games still hold up to the test of time. The educational stuff, not so much. And definitely, Easy Am's Word is something that I will not be using to write my scripts for this show. But on the whole, I think they hit the mark with the little 12 pack that they had there. So I was actually quite impressed and I think if you have a look at some of these games, you'll be impressed with how well they've held up too. Anyway, that's all I've got time for this week, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, remember to click that like button, share it with your friends so that they'll know a good game when they see it, and subscribe for future videos, because there will be more in the future. But until next time, I've been Zoe Kirk Robinson, you've been watching Game Hammer on the Knob Mouse channel, and I'll see you next time. Today's video is brought to you by my graphic novels, The Collected Life of Knobty Mouse, Volume 1, All Over the House, Volume 1, and All Over the House, Volume 2. Thank you.